mode. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Kavinsky and I want to welcome you all. It is now 1 p.m. so we will begin our presentation shortly. Today on Friday, July 27th, we will have our presentation on A Tale of Three Waterfronts given by David White, Rick Tainer, and Bill Needleman. And right now I'm actually going to hand it over to our new webcast assistant, um, Ben Lee, who's going to um, go over some of the housekeeping items. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the question box and we'll be able to answer those in, at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Here's a list of sponsoring chapters, divisions, and universities. I would like to thank all of the participating chapters, divisions, and universities for making these webcasts possible. Here's the list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these upcoming webcasts, please visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcast.htm and register for your webcasts of your choice. We're now offering distance education webcasts to help you get your ethics or law credits before the end of the year. These webcasts are available to view at www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts archive. To log your distance education CM credits, go to www.planning.org slash CM. Select activities by provider. Select APA Ohio chapter. Then select distance education and select your webcast of your choice. Follow, follow us on Twitter at Planning Webcaster. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on Planning Webcast Series sponsored by chapters, divisions, and universities. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM, select today's date, July 27th, and then select today's webcast, A Tale of Three Waterfronts. This webcast is available for one and a half CM credit. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available along with a six slide per page PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast-archive. Great, thank you, Ben. And at this time, I'm going to introduce Ben Frost, who is going to introduce our speakers for today, David White, Rick Tainer, and Bill Needleman. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, I'm the Professional Development Officer of the Northern New England Chapter, and I'm uh, delighted to be uh, helping with this panel today, A Tale of Three Waterfronts. For decades, the waterfronts of our port cities were the drivers of regional economic development, but as markets changed in the mid-20th century, these areas and many cities became derelict eyesores, economic black holes that sucked the energy out of these once thriving urban centers. Over the past few decades, however, new approaches to the function and utility of urban waterfronts have given these, new, these districts a new vitality and vibrancy. This webinar will present the waterfront redevelopment stories of three small cities, Portland, Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Burlington, Vermont. It'll highlight the economic, social, and environmental forces at play as these cities work to redefine themselves. These are three cities from the three states of northern New England. This is uh, one of two multi-state multi APA chapters, West Central being the other. Perhaps the, the central message that you hear today is that waterfronts evolve, but not necessarily in a predictable or formulaic fashion. Some important points to take away are that policy, process, and infrastructure may need to be uniquely tailored to these important parts of our cities. Our panelists today are all AICP members. I'll introduce them in reverse order, starting with David White. David is a native Vermonter and has worked for the city of Burlington since 1995, currently serving as its director of planning and zoning. He has a degree in geography from the University of Vermont and a master's degree from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences. Welcome, David. Next is Rick Tainter, planning director from the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire since 2009. He has more than 30 years of experience as a professional planner, including time spent in one of my favorite places, Newburyport, Massachusetts. Rick is a graduate of Harvard University and has a master's degree in resource economics from the University of Maine. Hello, Rick. Our first speaker will be Bill Needleman. 
who is a lifelong resident of the city of Portland, Maine. Bill is a senior planner in the city's planning division, where he's worked for the past 12 years, focusing on waterfront and transportation issues. He has a degree in geology from Boston College and a master's degree from the Muskie School at the University of Southern Maine. Bill, welcome and take it away. Thank you very much, Ben, and it's great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, Portland's waterfront planning and, and some of the learning we've done over the, the several decades, uh, and especially the last uh, 13 years that I've been working with waterfront issues on Port with Portland. Um, I would uh, leave it to folks to let me know if you're looking at something other than my presentation. And, and, uh, and, uh, so, um, so, um, yeah. So people are looking at my screen right now. Let's just look to confirm that. And uh, I'm going to launch in right here. I've got a, we've got a fair amount of ground to cover. Um, and there we go. I'm going to give a brief introduction to Portland, uh, Maine, not Oregon, for, since this is a national uh, presentation. I'm going to give a chronology of some of the waterfront planning initiatives that we've undertaken in Portland, um, talk about our policy framework, uh, which is really about balancing working waterfront uses with other uses, uh, the geographic application of these policies through zoning, um, and the differentiation between the different zones based on historic uses, infrastructure, and water depth, and then a case study and some examples of applying these policies through zoning and development standards. We're really looking to establish functional use relationships between marine and non-marine infrastructure and uses, as well as mixed-use infrastructure. Uh, we do this through performance-based zoning and straight-up site planning. The city of Portland is Maine's largest municipality with a population of about 66,000 within a metro region of 250,000. Portland is our financial, transportation, and service center for much of northern New England. The port of Portland is divided between two cities, Portland and South Portland, located at the mouth of the Four River and the southerly end of Casco Bay. Uh, the South Portland side of the river uh, it contains some significant liquid bulk freight and petroleum um, uh, docks, recreational berthing. And on the Portland side, it's dominated by commercial fishing, bulk and break bulk freight, as well as passenger services. Looking at a, an aerial view of downtown Portland, you can see that Portland is a peninsula, and we are highly defined by our waterfront geography. The waterfront itself, as we speak of in terms of the functional waterfront, is really the harbor where we have dredged water and enough water depth to undertake commercial marine activity. And there's about two and a half to three miles of waterfront um, that is located along that southeasterly side of our peninsula. Portland has a deep history and commitment to its waterfront and maritime industries. That is not entirely defined by fishing, which is the emblematic industry that we think of. And certainly fishing plays an important part of our history, but it's really shipping and rail, manufacturing along the waterfront, passenger transportation, and largely military that define our history as a waterfront community. And it's important to note that virtually all of these traditional uses have undergone significant decline, uh, and in the case of military, literally a disappearance. So what's left? Well, back in the 1980s, there were attempts to revitalize our waterfront through non-marine non development, such as the condominiums that you see in the background of this photograph. The foreground is dominated by the lobstering industry, which is one of the big industries that are left in our working waterfront. And these early, these 1980s attempts to revitalize the waterfront were displacing working waterfront uses, uh, which led to um, an important period and an important event in, in the city's history. Back in 1987, there was a referendum to create a moratorium on all non-marine development opportunities. This was a citizen-led referendum, and it passed by overwhelming margins. Um, the citizens of the city of Portland did not want to see, you know, moving back, more condominiums, and they wanted to retain the traditional maritime uses that we see in this photograph. Following the five-year moratorium, it was important to then step back and look at what can we do to encourage some degree of investment in this area. And the Waterfront Alliance was a group of property owners 
planners and citizen activists who came together to find out what is the appropriate balance. And it was through that, 2000, that not, excuse me, 1992 to 1994 process that we established the policies that we currently work with. But since that time, it's been a constantly evolving set of policies. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of my conversation talking about the latest round of that evolution, which is our central waterfront. In general, the policy basis for waterfront planning in Portland is uh, based on a priority of uses, where water-dependent uses, those uses that need to be on the water, the birthing, the lobster pounds, the processors who actually take cargo from the water to the land, those water-dependent uses are the highest priority use. Marine-related uses are those uses that don't necessarily need to be on the water, but are related to the waterfront economies and gain value from location on the waterfront. And then there is an allowance for compatible non-marine uses. We set this up as a pyramid, both to emphasize the priority, but also to emphasize the relative revenue potential of these uses. The non-marine uses often, and usually, have the greatest revenue potential compared to the higher priority uses. In this situation, those non-marine uses must respect the functional needs of higher priority uses, but they also provide needed revenue to invest in marine infrastructure. We apply these policies through zoning. And there's largely three sub-areas on Portland's waterfront. The western portion of the waterfront, located over um, to the left of the screen, is, um, large, is a deep water facility largely dedicated to freight both containerized freight and bulk freight. The easterly side of the waterfront is largely dedicated to passenger, passenger uses, both local ferry, cruise ships, and hopefully we'll be looking at international ferry again in the future. The eastern waterfront also has additional mixed uses in that complement and provide services for that passenger industry. And then we're going to concentrate on the central waterfront, which is lighter marine industry, mostly fishing, but other uses as well, um, mixed with non-marine uses. We want to promote marine industry and infrastructure while allowing compatible and supportive non-marine uses. We hope to also to achieve functional use relationships between the marine and the non-marine. We know that some of these uses actually support each other very strongly. These complementary uses, such as having our ferry services proximate to our tourist and shopping out localities. These are uses that are complementary and support each other strongly. Other uses are, may not be related, but can be compatible. The photograph that we're looking at here is located on the city's fish pier. There's literally an office building located on the city's fish pier. The office uses located on these upper floors are compatible with first floor marine support services, which support and are necessary for the highest priority uses, which are the berthed vessels here, and in this case, ground fishing vessels. This system of having non-marine upper floor uses supporting the infrastructure for marine uses works in the circumstance because it's designed to work. The infrastructure is robust. The circulation has enough capacity. There are safe alternatives for marine and non-marine pedestrians to, keep, to, to, to work together without getting in each other's way. And then there are incompatible use relationships. We are not looking to reproduce 1980-style uh, residential condominiums uh, in this industrial environment, uh, especially with these industries such as a bait shack, which has a lot of external impacts, including hours of operation and odors. It's, it, we have found that this is not a, a use relationship that we look to foster. When we try waterfront planning activities in the city of Portland, we always have to ask what we're doing. Are we doing a waterfront plan, or are we doing a land use plan that happens to be next to the water? They're fundamentally different things, because the image on the left of maintenance of fishing nets and environmental response, these vessels and services require different infrastructure than the mixed use infrastructure and commercial infrastructure that we see on the right. Commercial vessels have specific needs. And in Portland, we are talking about the commercial waterfront. Here, looking at a collection of different types of boats, but a boat yard and fishing vessels located in a pier environment. The infrastructure that we see here requires its own very specific type of planning. 
and every commercial vessel is a business. This is one of the things that we look at, the upper right-hand image of uh, lobster boats in Casco Bay. It's a pretty image, and it's an image that promotes our city as a tourist, as a tourist destination, but every vessel is a family business. Each, each vessel supports a number of employees as well as the owner. And it's in this concept of vessels as businesses is scalable. The seven-story structure in the, low, in the main photograph is just a portion of a freight vessel that employs many people and is a vital part of our larger economy. So these economies play out at largely different scales. In our central waterfront, which was the, pro, which was the focus of a recent process, and here we're looking at the central waterfront uh, circled in this photograph. Um, we've played this out in the most finest scale part of our waterfront. The central waterfront is comprised of about 14 privately held finger piers that are bracketed and anchored by some public infrastructure. The International Marine Terminal and the Main State Pier are publicly owned uh, deep water facilities with passenger services being concentrated in the east and freight to the west. The quasi-municipal fish pier anchors the central portion of the central waterfront. The central waterfront is a mixed-use district that's highly integrated with our downtown. These are 19th century piers that are literally roads into the water, and the street grid of the city and the pier infrastructure are tightly integrated, and it's often difficult to know when you've entered the piers and when you've entered the city because of this integration. You can see our downtown literally sitting on top of and right in back of uh, these 19th century and very small-scale piers. Unfortunately, while it is a, it's a wonderful geography, uh, there's aging infrastructure, there's limited revenue opportunities, and there are a great deal of challenges in the fishing economy specifically. This has resulted in building obsolescence and code compliance issues for many of these buildings, making them very difficult to reuse, which de-emphasizes the opportunities for investment. There's also water depth and dredging needs. Uh, harbors tend to be depositional environments. Silting of the harbor bottom diminishes the value of and the usefulness of birthing opportunities, which is the, fun which is the fundamental anchor of our marine economy. In order to address some of these issues, 12 of our commercial peer property owners came forward and said they, that they needed a rezoning. And these are competitors. These are folks who don't necessarily always get along with each other, but for them to come forward as uh, basically covering the entire of our privately held waterfront, coming forward together with a common set of proposals and needs, really spoke of revolution in the air. It wasn't the same as 1987, but had a similar feel where we knew that as a city something serious needed to be done. We engaged in a, a typical but robust planning process using our planning board and our city council as the major review authorities and um, undertook a rezoning uh, uh, evaluation and process. I'm not going to go into detail of this process, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. But we did look at our building and uses down there. We inventoried the birthing and public access areas. We inventoried parking. We inventoried businesses and employment. Uh, we got fairly far into the weeds with many of the, with much of this. Uh, letting, but it was important for us to understand that there was, you know, what was going on before we started to work with the policies that should support the marine economy. We were engaged in our public, and we learned a number of things. And we learned that this portion of the city was still a major employment area, and that these jobs were important that there wasn't all bad news, that there was some strong, there was some strength in the marine economy, and that it, they were still ongoing concerns occupying large portions of the properties. And what we also realized, that looking at the non-marine businesses that were in the area, that it, the mix and diversity of activity in the Waterfront Central Zone was probably its greatest asset and should be supported by and enforced by the policies and zoning in place. We took this information and drafted it into a vision statement, which was then incorporated into our comprehensive plan. And this is just a very brief excerpt. But the vision statement for our central waterfront is based around the idea of achieving a balance where the economic benefits of non-marine act activity support 
marine activity, which supports the waterfront and supports the city. Taking that vision and, and set of policies, we put it into new zoning. Again, I like with the process, I'm not going to go into detail as to what's in our zoning because um, that's a difficult thing for a Friday afternoon for you folks to sit through. Um, but I'll give a very brief overview of what's included in our zoning. I put the little pyramid up in the corner to remind us that this is still based on the priority of uses that was established back in 1992. All of this has been finding the appropriate balance for the specific portion of the waterfront that we're working with right now, the central waterfront. And in this area, we, we discovered that there were opportunities on that waterfront where we could have non-marine development without any marine requirements. These are areas that were far enough away from the water's edge or otherwise occupied by non-marine uses where the marine economy had already left or was probably never going to come into those areas. So we created a non-marine use overlay. In other areas, majority of area of those areas were preserved for marine use, allowing for some degree of non-marine use to, again, to encourage investment. There's a marketing requirement for marine tenants in those areas so that even when a non-marine use is allowed, the space first needs to be provided and made available to, the, to marine users. The marine infrastructure is required for investment. Larger scale projects are needed to put a percentage of their, of their investment back into the piers. And if they don't have a pier to invest in, if they happen to be one of those off the water activities, then they can contribute to a city fund. There are performance standards, and I emphasize these in the slide because they are important, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit. But these performance standards encourage peer functionality, compatibility with marine uses between non-marine uses and marine uses, standards for parking, and standards for view protection. There's also a requirement that we inventory and monitor the zone on an annual basis to understand what's happening and if there are any unintended consequences of the zoning. What didn't change is that there is still protected commercial birthing. There's no new opportunities for recreational birthing in the area, and there's no new opportunities for residential use. If anybody's interested in the zoning, please let me know, or my email is included at the end, and I'd be happy to email it to you. In a case study, and how does this apply, we're going to look at Merrill's Wharf and this, the Cumberland Cold Storage Building, a remnant of this wonderful 19, 1880s uh, industrial complex um, shown in this, this graphic. Back in 2010, there was still a significant portion of that complex still around in the form of a 100,000 square foot building it was used for self-storage, located right in the heart of Portland's working waterfront. Looking at the red re rectangle, that's the Cumberland Storage Building. There's the 100,000 square feet. Adjacent to the city's fish pier complex, adjacent to a net repair facility, which is a critical component for the, for the city's fishing fleet, and the property itself, owned by Cumberland Storage, was home to its own fleet of lobster vessels. Two years ago, there was a proposal to convert the upper floors into Class A office space, housing the largest law firm in the state of Maine. This is allowable under city zoning ordinance. But there was a simultaneous lease of adjacent fish pier property, including that net yard, to a lobster cooperative for a regional scale bait distribution business. This was a perfect storm for testing the lim limits. Here's the bait facility. Here's the largest law firm in the state. The solution was to simply apply the standards that were in place and make sure that those standards were reflected in the site plan that was in front of the planning board. So again, the red rectangle is the Cumberland Storage Building. And the lobster boats are located right along this edge of the, uh, of the the property which is in the water. There was a requirement and a dedicated, for a dedicated marine birthing space that would support the lobster vessels. There was improvements to the decking and to the fendering system for those lobster vessels. There was adequate circulation and turnaround for trailers that would also, again, support the loading and offloading of lobster vessels. But likewise, the legal office needed its own infrastructure. 
the brick sidewalk adjacent to the building provides a safe, accessible way for the patrons of that building to enter the building and circulate without getting in the way of or putting themselves at risk in this marine industrial environment. There was also through movement to the net yard to facilitate traffic moves and truck moves between properties. Looking at it in construction, there was also additional environmental uh, and stormwater infrastructure that was put in place. But here we see the improved pier edge. We see opportunities for marine storage, loading and offloading of commercial vessels here with the, with the building under construction uh, and not for renovation. We start to take these the things that we've learned in studying and applying these rules and think about the, the language of site planning for marine environments. And here's just a, a, a look at one of these side loading piers where if there's going to be non-marine development, what do you need on the first floor? What do you need in terms of pedestrian circulation and lighting to make it safe? How does the circulation relate to the loading of commercial vessels? Putting things together in the right order and in the right, in the right components will help make functional infrastructure that is safe and usable for everybody. And again, there are, we're starting to learn what are, the, what are the dimensional requirements that are necessary to make functional mixed-used infrastructure. First floors need to have sufficient floor-to-ceiling heights to facilitate marine industrial activity. Pedestrian, acti pedestrian circulation needs to be wide enough, as does vehicle circulation, as do the working aprons uh, for the loading and unloading of vessels. And not all piers are the same, so we need to think about this in terms of different horizontal and vertical alignments and, and layouts. Um, you know, this, this slide just gives an example of how if you have a constrained pier where there may not be room for dedicated pedestrian circulation, it may need to go into the building in order, again, to keep it separate from and safe in what is a, a potentially a hazardous industrial environment. All of this is asking the question is, can Portland avoid the assumed dichotomy? We had always assumed, or people had always told us, that you have to make a choice between, here we have the 1980s condominiums again, high value infrastructure, high value development, or employment. Widgery's Wharf, shown on here to the left, is low value development. But it also employs about 60 people and provides the homes for upwards of 25 businesses, counting each boat as a business. The condominiums on the left employ probably three or four people full time. So that, those are the goals that we're looking for is to avoid having to make the choice between jobs and value. And uh, the policies that are in place are looking to strike that balance. Happy to answer any questions and uh, looking forward to um, you know, hearing questions at the end of the presentation. And I'm going to have to keep, turn it over to the next person. And maybe the staff support the, can give me a hand and uh, take back the ball. And this is Rick Tainter uh, from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, very impressed with your presentation, Bill. Um, we'll try to have an equally interesting presentation here. Uh, I've been the planning director uh, in Portsmouth for about three years now, so um, a lot of what I am going to be showing you is uh, more research than personal experience. Uh, just to give you a, a, a context, Portsmouth is um, on the seacoast of New Hampshire, uh, about halfway between Boston and Portland. Uh, Portsmouth is a, a very different community than Portland. It's a much smaller community. Um, we are, we're about 22,000 people, um, so we're about a third of the size of Portland, about half the size of Burlington. Um, we have uh, we're we're on the Piscataqua River here, uh, just a, just a short distance from the mouth of the river, uh, 15 square miles, 
22,000 people, about 34,000 employees in the city, uh, largely uh, we're, we're a regional uh, service center and employment center. You can see here on the map the Pease International Trade Port, which used to be an Air Force base uh, until the uh, early to mid-1990s, uh, at which point it was uh, closed through the BRAC process and has been redeveloped as a major office park. Um, we have relatively, uh, we're relatively strong in terms of uh, retail uses, business services, health services, a very low unemployment rate of, of 4.2%. Uh, Pease itself uh, has about 4 million square feet of um, office industrial R&D uh, and uh, warehousing and transportation is responsible for about 7,000 of the 34,000 employees in the city. Uh, another major employment center just outside the city, uh, actually in Kittery, Maine, but it's called the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, uh, has another 4,300 employees on CV Island. Our waterfront um, is, as I said, along the Piscataqua River, just a couple of miles from its mouth. It's a natural deep water harbor. The waterfront also extends around the east side of the downtown uh, through uh, uh, Little Harbor and up Sagamore Creek. But we're really focusing on the, the central waterfront area of the city right along the, right along the waterfront. And this gives you a um, uh, kind of an overview of the waterfront. Let's see if I can get this out of my way here. OK. Um, at the uh, at upstream end of the river, we have uh, Public Service New Hampshire's uh, Schiller Station power plant and, and some uh, Sway Corporation's oil tanks. Uh, you can see uh, I-95, US-1 bypass, and US-1 uh, go right through the waterfront in, in sequence. Uh, there's some waterfront industrial right by I-95. The uh, state, port, uh, state pier, the Port of New Hampshire, is just outside the downtown, just at the entrance to the downtown. Uh, the central waterfront um, runs along the center from the from roughly the uh, the port to Pierce Island, and Pierce Island is just outside the downtown. It's recreational and also has our primary uh, sewer plant on it. This the entire waterfront in this area is just short of uh, four miles in length. Um, this gives you a sense of the zoning, the same area, um, the uh, kind of plum colored. Uh, in terms of my computer screen anyway, as is the uh, Waterfront Industrial District, uh, really geared for these uh, uses that are uh, marine dependent uses, uh, ter um, marine terminals and so forth. Um, the uh, red areas are our Central Business District. The Central Business B is in the dark red, uh, has heights up to uh, 60 feet maximum height. Uh, along the waterfront itself is our Central Business A, which has a maximum height of uh, 50 feet. Um, then we've got Prescott Park um, is in green is a municipal uh, zoned area, and Pierce Island, as I mentioned before, uh, another municipal uh, zoned area. Uh, back in the um, in the 1800s, early 1800s, along with uh, um, Portland and Newburyport and other uh, cities uh, along the coast here, there was a series of disastrous fires uh, that led to the um, enactment of brick laws that required uh, brick building in, in, the, in the downtowns, and that resulted in the kind of uh, context and, and physical environment that you see today. The, um, this is the, the central waterfront. Um, I've got marked as a star the, the Market Square, which is the current center of our downtown, and uh, with an arrow is uh, the intersection of Bow Street and Ceres Street along the waterfront, which is really the, the initial core of the of the uh, downtown. The initial the city's initial marketplace was along Ceres Street, a little bit uh, to the right of this arrow. This area here uh, was established in the mid 1700s, um, and then the uh, the center kind of moved to this area, which is called Spring Hill at the intersection of Bow and Ceres Street. This is uh, what it's like today. Same two locations. You can see. Uh, a lot of the, um, the physical structure of the area has changed. There have been some, some new uh, developments, like the uh, federal office building over here on the left and our parking garage on the right. But generally, the historic character of that, of that downtown waterfront area has been maintained. And this is the view toward the waterfront from Market Square, again, the same uh, connection. So you can see that the, the, the waterfront is very closely related to our, our, our small downtown area. Focusing a little bit closer on the downtown, um, this is the, the real central waterfront. It's less than a mile in length. Um, starts from 
what is well known to anybody in Portsmouth is the salt piles right across from the Sheraton uh, Hotel. It's a, we've got the industrial right next to the hospitality industry here, and that's really a, a characteristic of our downtown is the close interrelationship of the tourist and, uh, and residential uses with the working waterfront, the small working waterfront, much less extensive than you see in, in, um, in Portland. Uh, we also have some open space areas. Strawberry Bank is sort of a, a miniature Sturbridge Village. It's an open air museum with uh, uh, homes from a variety of eras that have uh, been uh, restored in place as a, as a, as a museum. Uh, Prescott Park is a, a beautiful park along the waterfront. And then Pierce Island is a recreational park, a boat launch, a swimming pool, and so forth. So it's, it's again, that tight mix of uses. Here's a, another view showing how all these pieces work together. And just take a quick little tour. We're starting at the outside of the downtown here with the, the Port of New Hampshire. Um, uh, on the, in the distance is a, a pile of uh, scrap metal, which is another um, well-known vista in, as you enter the city of Portsmouth. Uh, and then we have here the, uh, the, the port for the Isle of Shoals Ferries, the, uh, the steamship company that um, is a major tourist draw. This is the, uh, the steamship heading out to the Isle of Shoals next to the salt pile and the salt pile in front of the hotel. So again, all of these uses are in, in very close proximity, the cars in the front of the parking for the steamship company. As you move into the downtown, you have historic gardens uh, for historic house, house museums. Uh, this is Ceres Street in front and, and the beginnings of our outdoor dining decks which line the waterfront. We have really lost uh, over time a, a lot of the working waterfront in the very core and it's really become a uh, center for uh, uh, residences, uh, dining, and lately for office uses as well. Uh, here we're looking across uh, the river to uh, Badgers Island in Kittery, Maine, and off to the distant right of the photograph, you can just see the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on Seavey Island. Moving down Ceres Street uh, toward the Federal Office Building, um, we have here the um, tugboats, an active tugboat company that is, uh, with, again, with the hotel in the background. And this is that core, that central uh, uh, intersection of Ceres Street and Bow Street uh, at Spring Hill, where the, you can see the uh, intersection of the residences, restaurants, uh, the restaurant decks on the left, the tugboats, uh, all different aspects of the city's uh, uses. Recently, we've, we've created a small park in this area, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, dining, and then these are old um, industrial buildings, in this case a power plant that has been converted to um, originally to office uses and more recently uh, reconverted to residential uses. Then getting outside the downtown, we have uh, the beginnings of Prescott Park and, and Pierce Island in the distance. In the front is an old commercial use, an old former restaurant, former pier, this is Pier 2, which is in the process of being converted to uh, condominiums. There's a condominium project about to be, uh, you can see the footings just on the right there, it's underway. We have our state fish pier in front of the park. Another view of the fish pier with the bridge to Pierce Island. And then looking back at the downtown with the, with the fish pier in the front. And uh, some, some of the historic buildings just outside the downtown on Mechanic Street. And some small uh, waterfront um, uses, some small fishing boat uh, docks. And you can see a few lobstermen as you get outside the downtown. But really, that is not the characteristic of Portsmouth as it is of Portland. It's really become much more a, uh, uh, a mix of hotel, hospitality, uh, residential, retail uses, with some commercial fishing uh, on, the, uh, on the easterly edge of the downstream edge of the downtown and marine industrial uses just upstream. The, the transformation of Portsmouth really began in the uh, late 60s and early 70s with some um, uses, you, we hear a lot about the cultural capital and, and uh, the creative class and so forth. And here we have the Theater by the Sea, which moved into some old warehouse space on Ceres Street uh, back in the 60s. And generally, a lot of the upper floors tended to be vacant at that time. There was not much uh, focus from, uh, as far as I can tell, from city government on this area. It tended to be from uh, private um, individual investors uh, taking advantage of these available spaces. Uh, back, beginning in the 70s, I believe, uh, a few landlords started looking at converting their upper floors into residences, and that really 
uh, helped transform the downtown and some of the, there was a, a Siri Street Merchants Association and a Bow Street Merchants Association, which really uh, kind of spearheaded the d development. So this is back in, in 1969, this photograph. Um, by 2006, you can see that the entire uh, street has been uh, converted to, uh, to residential uses upstairs and, and a really dense mix of commercial uses downstairs, including many restaurants. Um, and this picture was taken before some some more recent city improvements, and the city has gone in and has uh, recently widened sidewalks and um, made them more accessible, so that so to really build on what we have. And it, I think the city city strategy has really been to see what what the natural evolution has been and to really accommodate it and support it, rather than try to fight it. Um, this is on the uh, the land side of Bow Street, uh, the the construction, uh, the redevelopment of a former wharf area into a um, uh, a mixed-use building, primarily retail and office uses. That's the old Martingale Wharf building, uh, and then this is what it looked like uh, just about the time it was being completed and occupied. And on the other side, uh, this is the, the uh, what we have as a resource there. And the the 50-foot height limit here has been um, massaged because we look at average grade. So in this case, the uh, building is uh, four to five stories in the front and seven stories in the rear, and it's got. Uh, uh, restaurants on uh, two levels, the, the wharf level and then two levels above that, and then office uses and all the other levels. The, uh, the downtown area the, the, it's, it's well known for its the decks, uh, the restaurant decks which stretch out along the waterfront. We don't have um, finger piers uh, sticking out into the water so much anymore, but we have wharfs that uh, run along parallel to the water. water. And uh, these are very um, actively used for for outdoor dining. When we did the master plan in uh, our most recent master plan in 2005, we had a number of areas where we uh, where we talked about uh, the waterfront and its importance to the downtown and, and people in, in the um, in the city really value the waterfront as a place to be but also as a, as a connection to the, to the downtown's history. So the one of the key land use uh, objectives in the, down, in the master plan was to strengthen the visual and functional functional connections to the waterfront uh, because of its importance to downtown's history and character. And I should mention also that um, in addition to the various zoning districts that I showed in an earlier slide, the entire waterfront is within our historic district, which gives us a great degree of control over um, the, the design of buildings and to some extent um, helps us influence how buildings are used in the downtown area, the, the various uses. We don't uh, strictly control uh, uses we've got a wide range of uses that are allowed. We're more we're more concerned with with form perhaps than with function, but we do uh, get at that through the historic district review also. And our economic development element, um, a key goal was to actively support all areas that comprise the water dependent working waterfront. We wanted to increase access to the downtown waterfront. We were we had a, a river walk project that had been two decades in planning and had still not uh, got off the ground. And uh, we wanted to improve Siri Street, and I showed you a, a photograph of those improvements uh, a, a, little bit while, a little while ago. And we also wanted to support the New Hampshire Port Authority's effort to promote the use of the port as a working seaport. The, the uh, salt piles, the scrap metal piles, um, they, they may not be the most attractive aspects of, of our downtown, but they are really valued by people as a, uh, as a connection to, to the waterfront and to keep those areas open. They, they certainly don't want to have those areas uh, turned into condominiums or retail uses. We have a number of city projects going on. I should say that the, the city's uh, approach to the, to the water, waterfront uh, development has evolved over time. It's been adaptive. It's been somewhat opportunistic as, as, um, as opportunities arise. We try to make incremental improvements. Uh, one of the earliest things we did was at Pierce Island. Pierce Island had been really a, a, a backwater. Uh, we had our, our sewer plant at the, at the far end of it, but the rest of it was really uh, just open, open land with no development. And um, in the 1980s uh, and, and uh, getting into the 1990s, uh, the city an, adopted and then uh, started implementing a master plan for Pierce Island, creating a new park at Fort Tree Island, stabilizing the shoreline so that it could be um, better used uh, for access to the water. Uh, improving, building and improving an outdoor swimming pool, building a number of trails on the far end of the island, and uh, uh, managing a, a boat launch in the summertime. 
Um, as I mentioned, there was a there was a 20-year project for the, for a river walk, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit along the along the water, that evolved into a public-private uh, project on Siri Street, kind of pulled back a, a small park, a mini river walk, a smaller version of the river walk, street and sidewalk improvements, and even the simplest things such as a, a shared trash enclosure to help. Uh, the many restaurants in there manage the uh, the, the um, quality of the, of the waterfront. There are five five uh, property owners who were involved in a project that was uh, involved land swaps, easements, uh, scaling back the um, the river walk from around 800 feet to around 400 feet, and uh, and so forth. We also try to uh, enhance and maintain visual access to the waterfront whenever possible. Uh, and in connection with a uh, state, a two-state project, actually the, the reconstruction replacement of the Memorial Bridge, uh, we've been looking at the planning of a river walk and park on the on the uh, New Hampshire side. This was the original um, Piscataqua River Walk project back in um, around 2003, 2004, something like that. And you can see the area in red uh, was meant to connect. Um, existing walkways and existing wharf at Harbor Place, and to try to link all those together with a with a, um, a walkway along along a new and reconstructed um, wharf parallel to the river. What ultimately happened was a much smaller project, as I mentioned, with a uh, about a 400 foot uh, walkway connecting between restaurants along the along the waterfront. A miniature park here. Um, this is the inter down here at the uh, lower center of the screen is the intersection of uh, Siri Street and Bow Street, and then the uh, the shared trash container to keep the area more uh, visually appealing and uh, sanitary. This is the park that we created. It's a very small park. We just were able to to create it out of some existing city land along the waterfront um, and some. Uh, some land exchanges and easements with abutting property owners. Um, this is our uh, the trash area that we're so proud of uh, that really does keep the um, the area much more uh, visually attractive and sanitary for all the restaurant uses in that area. And we've also you can see some of the, the sidewalk improvements along Sirius Street. Um, this is from the park, looking out toward the the restaurant decks, and this is the uh, the this is the river walk itself. This is the connection. Uh, with restaurants on both sides of it, uh, heading down is an open area beyond where we where we're looking right now. But it takes you down and gives you access to the entire um, length of the the waterfront behind Bow Street. At the end of the river walk, um, there are private developments that have created uh, stairs down to the waterfront. So that's this is not part of the public. Um, project, but it's something that um, links to our project. And when we reviewed the the building on the right that you can't see just beyond this brick wall, there's another parallel staircase there. It's part of keeping uh, uh, good access down to the waterfront uh, from Bow Street, so that we can so we have continuous pedestrian movement through that area and really build on on what we have. And we also um, look to enhance visual access to the water wherever possible. This is a um, a view of a, a development that was converted from industrial use to a residential and commercial mixed use site. And in this area, we've um, may, uh, negotiated a public access easement. So the, the, the white fence that you see there is actually a, marking the edge of a deck that sticks out over the uh, embankment, looking down with, with panoramic views to the, uh, the up, upstream and downstream on the river. This really gives us the uh, an opportunity at various places, even though the, the, the waterfront is, is largely privatized by these buildings that are parallel to the water, gives us an opportunity to get um, periodic access, visual access to the waterfront and, and maintain the continuity of pedestrian movement. That's one of our, our major goals is to maintain continuous pedestrian uh, paths through the downtown and along the river and providing these intermittent uh, visual access points as part of that. In connection with the um, the uh, replacement of the Memorial Bridge, which carries Route 1 across the Piscataqua River, the city is working on a concept plan right now for a park on the New Hampshire side of the bridge, along with a small uh, platform shown here as Memorial Harbor Walk um, that is adjacent to a private uh, walkway here that, again, provides more um, connection to the waterfront. 
generally our challenges uh, that we see in Portsmouth have been how do we uh, maintain and enhance public access to the waterfront uh, in, the, uh, in the context of all of these, uh, the demand for uh, residential and commercial uses, uh, and maintaining the small amount of water dependent businesses. We have, a, we have a waterfront business district, which I haven't really talked about, uh, to deal with some of those small lobstering uh, businesses to the east of the downtown, but really looking at, at, at accommodating restaurant and re residential demand along the waterfront, recognizing that that is the, the transformation that has been made in Portsmouth, and uh, we're not going to get the, the uh, industrial waterfront back. And how, but maintaining that, maintaining the public access to that, as part of that process. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. And I will now turn it over to David. Hello, David White here from the city of Burlington, Vermont. I hope that uh, you're able to see my screen. Um, so Burlington, Vermont, uh, like Portland and Portsmouth, uh, Burlington has a very rich maritime history. However, our history and our waterfront has evolved uh, very differently. And our story is really about the evolution into a more of a public waterfront for water-based recreation and community events. First, a little bit of context. Um, Burlington is one of about uh, 30 different uh, Burlingtons in North America, so uh, this is the one in Burlington, Vermont. Um, we're not on the ocean, but we're close. Um, we are on um, almost a great lake. Uh, lake Champlain is the seventh largest water body in the United States. Um, and we're about two hours south of Montreal, three and a half hours from Boston, and about six hours from New York City. Um, we're the largest city in Vermont uh, and in the Lake Champlain Basin, and um, mostly known as a college town, uh, home of the University of Vermont, but uh, uh, a number of uh, great uh, national business chains that you've probably heard of, like Ben and & Jerry's and, uh, um, and Brugger's Bagels, and to name a couple. A little more context for uh, our relationship to the water. Um, as you can see in the slide, almost 80% of our boundary is uh, water-based, both uh, along the Winooski River to uh, the east and uh, Lake Champlain to the west. Um, no point in the city is more than uh, a mile and three quarters from either of these bodies of water. So we have a tremendous amount of waterfront, if you will. But, but uh, the focus of my presentation really is in uh, Burlington's Inner Harbor, which is about 120 acres with about 3,000 feet of Lake Champlain shoreline. Commercial use of our inland waterways really began back in the early 19th century uh, and is what put us on the map. Um, in 1823, the completion of the 46 miles of uh, Champlain Canal uh, provided access to markets to the south and to the west. Uh, Principally, the Mohawk and Erie canals uh, towards Buffalo and the Hudson River to New York City. Uh, and in 1843, the 12 mile Chambly Canal in Quebec around the Richelieu Rapids provided access to the north and the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, this permitted the American entrepreneurs to import large quantities of cheap Canadian timber, um, and Lake Champlain became a major commercial artery in Burlington, its primary port. Um, in about 1850, the Burlington and Rutland Railroad reached uh, the area, allowing us to become a very important multimodal center. The creation of a breakwater in 1836 provided protection for our harbor from wind and waves uh, across the Broad Lake. Lake Champlain is about 10 miles across um, at its uh, greatest width. Uh, and this was a very important public investment uh, in order to, uh, for our waterfront to function. Uh, the breakwater is uh, timber cribbing filled and faced with stone. Uh, it was later expanded in 1867 and is uh, a little over 4,000 feet in length. Um, it was rehabilitated by the U.S. Arm Army Corps of Engineers about five years ago uh, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 
closely following the construction of the breakwater saw the beginning of filling of portions of Burlington's harbor to make room for waterfront commerce and the railroad itself. To accomplish this, thousands of yards of stone and fill were placed um, in wooden cribbing um, behind um, the bank. You can see in this slide here uh, demarcation of what was the original shoreline. And uh, the filling of the shoreline took place in a couple of different phases. Um, <clears throat> this uh, early phase was in the 1850s uh, and the later phase in the 1870s. So like any commercial waterfront, uh, watercraft is the essential element of what makes everything work. Uh, in these images, uh, these are uh, sailing canal schooners. Um, the, uh, these boats were originally built uh, around 1823 as an experiment uh, to sail from distant lake ports into the canal on power uh, of the wind. And once they reached the canal, the masts were lowered and the centerboard raised. Um, and transform the vessel into something that could uh, navigate the canal system. Uh, by 1862, the expansion of the canal system allowed for uh, an expansion in the design of these boats, uh, which are really a critical element to uh, the commercial trade on the lake. Um, uh, the, the new vessel, in, uh, called the 1862 class, was about 88 feet in length and 14 feet in beam. Um, many of these sailing, sailing canal schooners were built here in Burlington, including this replica on the left of the Lois McClure. She was launched here in Burlington in 2004, uh, and she sails uh, under the flag of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum uh, all throughout the canal system um, and beyond. We also have several shipwrecks um, uh, in our harbor, including two that are listed on the National Register. In 1826, the Lake Champlain Transportation Company was founded. Uh, they provide ferry service uh, across the lake today, uh, three different locations, uh, including Burlington. Um, in the late 1800s to early 1900s, tourism via a variety of lake steamers you see in the slide um, reached its heyday. And at the height of the boom, there were over 1,000 steamers, ships, and canal boats um, operating on Lake Champlain. Um, in 1906, the steamer Ticonderoga, um, the most prominent image here, was launched at the Shelburne Shipyard. Uh, she's currently on exhibit at the Shelburne Museum um, south of Burlington and also is listed on the National Register. So I mentioned the access to uh, the Canadian market through the uh, Chambly uh, Canal. Um, that really led Burlington uh, to become a major lumber port and eventually the third largest lumber port in the United States by 1873, um, receiving something on the order of 170 million board feet of timber from Canada. Uh, that timber was then processed on our waterfront uh, into dimensional lumber and then transported uh, further down uh, through the canal system. Um, the 1800s also saw the rise of the Western timber industry, however, and that Began, that was kind of the beginning of the end of uh, our boom. Um, these images are from 1875, uh, showing stacks of lumber um, on the waterfront. And you can see the breakwater in the background, uh, which even had a, a, uh, a keeper's house. Um, that house actually exists today, not on the breakwater. It was relocated into one of our residential neighborhoods. Um, by 1897, however, Burlington's uh, domination of the of um, the timber trade um, came to an abrupt end with the um, passage of the Dingley Tariff, which imposed a, a tax on all timber imported from Canada. Burlington's waterfront is also the site of one of the nation's first municipal power plants, constructed in 2000, uh, 1905, shown here on the left. Uh, this 1940s image shows uh, some bulk petroleum uh, in the uh, tanks in the upper right um, and area of the lake that has still had yet to be filled. In 1954, the Moran Generating Plant was built. Uh, it was decommissioned in uh, 1986, and we'll talk a little bit more about that property uh, as we go forward. Um, I mentioned bulk petroleum. That was the next phase of Burlington's industrial uh, history. Uh, 
Uh, during the 1900s, our waterfront really transitioned from a lumber port into a rail yard and, and eventually a bulk petroleum facility. By the 1950s, gasoline, jet, jet fuel, home heating oil were all being stored on our waterfront, uh, frequented by, uh, by rail, by barge, and by uh, trucks. Um, <clears throat> we also served as an, an alternate fuel site uh, for storage of uh, jet fuel during the Cold War for the Plattsburgh Air Force Base, which is uh, on the other side of the lake. And this was really Burlington's waterfront until the early 1990s or so. There was, uh, up to that point, hundreds of thousands of gallons of petroleum products delivered each year by barge and train and then distributed uh, throughout the countryside. Um, and our prime waterfront land, lands were virtually inaccessible to the public. But in the late 1960s, uh, we saw a transition uh, again beginning to happen, and uh, our waterfront uh, began what uh, I guess I would hope would be its uh, last downturn. This image is from uh, 1978, and this is uh, kind of the heart of the waterfront area from here. <clears throat> so really, this turning point in 1960 uh, to today, perhaps, um, really influenced by uh, the domination of rail and highways for moving freight, so no longer were, was uh, waterborne transportation uh, in favor. That infrastructure then began to fall into disrepair, uh, and uh, we saw rising interest uh, for water-based recreational opportunities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of those options and opportunities um, as they presented themselves here in Burlington in the mix of both public and private initiatives um, that came along. But, but ultimately, the story is, uh, uh, as Ben pointed out in the beginning, um, is one about uh, evolution and, uh, and change and really struggling to find a consensus uh, and ultimately achieve uh, complete results of what's the future of our waterfront. So back in the 1960s, during urban renewal, the city began to turn its focus on uh, um, the water and kind of what was happening down here. Uh, some of those improvements included some changes that would be completely unacceptable today. Um, like many other cities across the country, Burlington came very close to having a four-lane limited access highway across our waterfront. You know, as many of you probably appreciate where these projects uh, did go forward, large stretches of cities were destroyed and the waterfronts were completely cut off uh, from the public. Um, fortunately, however, by 1968, the waterfront highway uh, proposal was off the table in favor of a plan to use existing streets. But the city kept its eye on the waterfront as the urban renewal plans uh, on the upland side began to progress with a new hotel and high-rises planned for the urban renewal site, the waterfront decaying wharfs and oil tanks and rail yards uh, was looking increasingly unattractive and seen as a deterrent to the proposed upland and uh, upscale redevelopment proposals. In 1973, the city adopted a zoning requirement that would phase out the oil storage tanks and other industrial uses within the core of the waterfront. And this was our first concrete step towards physical improvements of the waterfront. And soon after, citizens became, became agitating uh, for more public access, including a bike path uh, through the central core. So that really began the, uh, the, the activism uh, for uh, public access and public use of the waterfront. In 1978, the first waterfront plan was created uh, by the Waterfront Board of the Planning Commission. Um, and this plan developed a series of guidelines around redevelopment. Um, it focused on uh, access and circulation and important visual cor corridors, um, defined sub-areas within, within the waterfront for different types of development act activity and a range of performance standards. Um, several of these, uh, um, <clears throat> both the, the performance standards and the, the framework that was established by this plan are things that we uh, still employ today. At the same time, the city was seeing interest from private development on the waterfront in uh, the late 1970s where a proposal referred to as uh, triad that included uh, more than 100 condominium units, 
uh, expanded breakwater, 100 boat marina, and 70,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, this was a, a project that the city had supported, was uh, permitted by the city, but un but uh, financing fell through uh, and was never completed. Um, the the project on the screen uh, dates back to 1980, a uh, $35 million project with a 150-room hotel, retail space, another 100 slip marina, and 240 condominiums, uh, and, and uh, an 18-story building that's not seen on the slide. Um, this proposal did not go well uh, and was eventually withdrawn in the face of opposition from the city and, and citizens. The last major uh, public project was referred to as the Alden, Alden Plan in 1984. Um, this was uh, uh, put together by the Alden Waterfront Cor Corporation, who was able to assemble about 25 acres of property uh, on our waterfront and uh, working with Boston architects Ben and Jane Thompson, noted for their work in Fingal Hall. Um, this very complex and comprehensive uh, redevelopment plan uh, eventually died in December of 1985 when a public vote for tax increment financing failed to receive a two-thirds majority required for its approval. <clears throat> and once again, the, the, the citizens reacting to large wholesale uh, private uh, redevelopment of the waterfront. So, uh, and a similar redevelopment proposal came um, from the railroad itself, who owned a tremendous amount of land um, on the waterfront. Um, their proposal for massive redevelopment um, raised the specter of uh, public trust. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, a lot of this land was originally uh, lake. It was filled uh, in the question of who really uh, has the right to determine the use of these lands when uh, it was formerly late. Um, in a landmark Vermont Supreme Court decision, uh, the city won a major victory that led to a successful negotiations with the railroad for the city to purchase uh, the property for public use. Um, and as a result, plans were drawn up for a waterfront park. Um, that park was uh, eventually developed, and uh, you can see it here in this slide. Uh, in 1990 and again in 1998, um, the, the city and the citizens adopted uh, an urban renewal plan. This is an urban renewal district uh, of the city. Um, that This plan really outlined uh, essential guiding principles for how future waterfront development would take place, really emphasizing public access. Uh, and, and public enjoyment of the lake and minimizing intrusion of, uh, of vehicles. There were 13 major project elements uh, described in that plan uh, and when it was readopted in 1998, uh, some of these had been accomplished, some of them hadn't, uh, and uh, it was a total of 22 ind uh, individual proposals that uh, were part of that project. Uh, it wasn't until 2000 that the city had prepared a plan for the harbor itself, although several past studies had been accomplished. Um, this comprehensive water use and harbor management plan uh, focused on the entire 3,000 acres of Burlington Harbor, which is uh, part of the, uh, defined under the city charter. Uh, today our waterfront is a very vibrant, uh, very active mixed use area. Um, this slide coming into focus uh, shows the zoning pattern. Uh, just looking at the traditional colors here, uh, red is uh, commercial and mixed use. Uh, the yellows are residential all on upland. Uh, green is public uh, property. Um, and uh, the purple is industrial. Um, where you see the, uh, the cross-hatched areas, uh, these are areas that are subject to uh, private, uh, privately owned land, publicly owned land, but subject to public trust law. Um, where uses permitted um, on public trust lands are defined um, by the Vermont Supreme Court decision I mentioned earlier, uh, as well as the Vermont legislature. So, so we simply implement uh, the types of land uses that are allowed here. And they're extremely limited uh, to uh, public uses and those uses related to railroading and warping. 
So as we look forward to uh, continued evolution of our waterfront, um, we have we struggle with the balance of uh, various challenges and priorities. And the the industrial legacy um, left uh, a lot of brownfield contamination. Um, virtually every spot of land you're going to want to dig up uh, in our city and on our waterfronts is a potentially a brownfield site. Um, mentioned a lot of the waterfront land is public trust, so it has uh, limitations as to the uses that can uh, take place. Um, and those limitations do, uh, certainly impose great limitations on the, the economic potential uh, of that property. And uh, finally, historic resources, both land and water. Um, I mentioned that, again, this land was filled back in the 1870s, and uh, it's, all, uh, it's all a historic resource. Um, the number of uh, a handful of historic buildings down here, not much has been um, defined and registered uh, as a district, but there are all kinds of resources down here that are um, eligible for listing, um, as well as uh, resources that are in the water. But uh, the priorities of the public are really quite clear, um, again, around uh, centering on public access, uh, eco economic inclusion, so that uh, it's a place where anybody can go and anybody can feel comfortable. It's not just uh, very high end. And particularly as we think about this uh, in more modern, modern context, uh, a mixture of uses and year-round activity. And we'll talk about those things a little bit more as we go forward. Um, we've used a variety of different tools and, and made an, many, many different public investments. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some of these uh, in some of these later slides. So one of these public investments had to do with um, the removal of the, or, the oil storage tanks. And I mentioned that uh, began in the 1970s with a uh, zoning requirement. Um, and um, by the early 1990s, the fuel storage facilities had been completely abandoned. Um, about 20 tanks in all were removed from the city's waterfront, uh, many of them by the city itself. Uh, 1988 was the first public access, the first uh, public land uh, on Burlington's waterfront with uh, the development of the Burlington Community Boathouse. Um, this was uh, modeled after uh, a similar boathouse that uh, was on the, the shore uh, going back into the uh, early 19th century, um, but was really the first physical presence. And because we didn't own any land, uh, it is a barge that's floating in the lake, and we uh, obtained access to it, and uh, that was kind of the first uh, public presence. Um, <clears throat> 1992, the city of Burlington purchased 45 acres from the Central Vermont Railway uh, and established the Urban Reserve. Uh, this area of land uh, north of the Moran Generating Plant, um, shown uh, here where my pointer is, um, is uh, land that uh, by intention was purchased and set aside uh, for a future generation to determine what its use should be. Um, uh, as part of the funding to purchase that property, we're required that at least 40% of the land is protected from development uh, under a floating conservation easement. And one of the ongoing conversations we have here in Burlington is, uh, are we there yet? So in 1992, the land was purchased. You know, what constitutes a future generation? Um, we have a new mayor. Uh, was just elected in March, and he's indicated that he thinks the time has come for us to begin uh, having that public conversation about the, the future of this particular piece of property. Uh, has a number of uh, limitations. Uh, it is public trust. Um, it has limited infrastructure. It has even more limited access. Uh, but there uh, has long been an interest in, uh, in both private and public uh, development of this site number of other public development uh, activities have gone on over the years from a new Coast Guard station to the redevelopment of uh, Lake Street, uh, a skate park, um, and a surface parking lot that uh, includes uh, pervious pavement and a very important stormwater management system as well as uh, public information and restrooms. You know, one, one thing I almost forgot to mention that most people think of when they think of Burlington 
uh, is our nine-mile bike path. Um, the bike path is a rail trail conservation uh, conversion um, done back in the early 1990s and uh, runs the entire western length of the city, including through the middle of our downtown waterfront. We've also seen a fair amount of private development uh, on our waterfront, um, as shown in these images, uh, including uh, hotel and condominiums just upland of, of the waterfront itself off of Battery Street. And a major nonprofit uh, investment. Uh, this project is the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain, uh, 2.2 acre campus uh, on College Street, uh, recognizing Senator Patrick Leahy's lifelong dedication to the stewardship of the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, it is a Lake Aquarium and Science Center. It's also home to the University of Vermont's uh, Rubenstein Ecosystem Science Laboratory, um, as well as um, a variety of uh, both water and uh, historical um, conservation initiatives. Um, there's a Navy Memorial here. UVM has its research vessel here. Um, it's really a, a tremendous year-round attraction uh, on our waterfront. And I emphasize the year-round part as being particularly of interest. Also been uh, nonprofit housing development uh, on the waterfront. Uh, this particular project, uh, referred to as the Depot Street Housing, is um, was developed by the Champlain Housing Trust, and it I'm falling apart here in my slides, but it's a 40-unit apartment complex. Uh, 28 apartments are for rent earning up to 60% of the median income with six apartments for a household at 100% of the median income. Um, it's a LEED certified um, building and uh, an award winner um, for a variety of different uh, uh, both energy conservation and sustainable development uh, awards. Um, so affordable housing built right on our waterfront. And I mentioned the Moran Center. Um, Earlier in the presentation, this is the former uh, electric generating station, coal-powered generating station. And uh, this project is one that the city's been working, uh, looking to see redevelopment of for decades. It goes back to the original urban renewal plan. Um, and this is the most current iteration of the plans for this site. But uh, actual use and program of the building remains uh, uncertain in the city's uh, undertaking a, a, another round of uh, seeking proposals. So our, our waterfront today is a major site for community events and festivals from the Vermont City Marathon, USA National Triathlon, Vermont Brewers Festival, Lake Champlain Maritime Festival, Discover Jazz. Um, uh, in 2009, we celebrated the quadricentennial of the, the, the um, exploration of Lake Champlain by Samuel de Champlain. Uh, this was really an international celebration with our uh, partners in Quebec. Um, 13 days of world-class performances on our waterfront um, and boosted uh, 10 to 15 million dollars into our regional economy uh, at a time when we all really needed it. So what's next? Um, Burlington was very fortunate uh, about a year and a half ago to receive uh, um, one of HUD's uh, Sustainable Community Challenge Grants. Um, and we are currently in the process of developing a comprehensive master plan for both the downtown and the waterfront. Um, the project just released a couple of weeks ago its uh, uh, draft plan for public discussion. And uh, if you're interested, you can uh, see it and download and comment on it uh, through our website. Um, but the project really highlights a variety of different uh, redevelopment opportunities on our waterfront, seeming together many of these uh, past planning initiatives that have been done over the years, but making sure that they all integrate well um, one to another. Uh, and this image just illustrates the most of the uh, the core of our waterfront from uh, the uh, ferry terminal. Um, currently, this is this this area I'm pointing to here is the site of the Lake Champlain transportation ferry um, and the, that Moran generating station is up here. 
Um, that's really the, the, the core of our urban waterfront area. Um, we make a number of different recommendations uh, for uh, redevelopment opportunities, both public and private, uh, throughout the waterfront. Um, specifically, one of the issues that we're challenged with is uh, access to the water. Um, between Battery Street and Lake Street, there's a major uh, embankment, and you have to go a pretty long way to get from, from College Street on one end or Depot Street on the other uh, to get down there if you happen to be up here in Waterfront Park. So we, we show a number of different opportunities for stairway streets and other mechanisms to get you over the, over the embankment. Um, and down into the waterfront area. Um, <clears throat> in this slide, we one of the major recommendations of this proposal is a relocation of the ferry terminal, currently located here at the foot of King Street. We're proposing to relocate it down here to the foot of Maple Street. Um, what this allows us to do is to consolidate um, the uh, mixed use, oops, sorry about that, allows us to consolidate a variety of mixed-use public and private development uh, in this part of the waterfront, as well as then uh, industrial and, and other public uses down here. This is the city's main wastewater treatment plant. Um, we uh, show expansion of marina services, uh, addition of something on the order of 300 uh, slips, potentially, uh, in our waterfront, uh, aided by the new breakwater um, and then upland marina support services to support those uh, both transient and seasonal boaters. We have a tremendous demand for waterfront um, access by the lake. Um, there's something like an eight to ten year waiting list uh, to get uh, one of our uh, seasonal slips. Um, and if you want to get a transient slip, you need to be here early because we're sold out uh, most nights throughout the summer. Um, the last area here in the very southern end of the waterfront adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant, um, we show uh, an expansion of the city street network, the relocation of our uh, existing rail yards that are con continue to be an active rail yard for uh, fuel uh, distribution as well as salt and, uh, and cement and other products, um, but it has redevelopment potential um, that we want to uh, try to take advantage of while maintaining the rail activity um, and embracing the access to the lake. So that's the end of my portion of the presentation. Uh, up here on the screen, uh, you see the contact information for all three of us. Uh, we're happy to talk to you uh, offline or, or otherwise. So I'll see how to hand the ball back. All right, David, thanks so much. Uh, this has been, a, I think, a terrific series of presentations that um, well, should reflect different philosophies on waterfront deep redevelopment and, and preservation. Um, you know, from um, uh, Portsmouth's uh, focus on, on letting things evolve as they will, as, as Rick called it, the natural evolution. Bill talking about balancing the marine and non-marine um, interests. And David, when you were making your presentation, I, I early on called this the waterfront of broken development dreams. But uh, what you're talking about now, uh, as Burlington is, is um, uh, coming up with new plans, is looking back at the, the old development plans, some of which failed, but had some good ideas in them. And you're not abandoning those. So that's uh, congratulations to you all. We have a Thanks. lot of questions. And um, uh, several uh, listeners have asked about sea level rise. And that has obvious implications for Portland and Portsmouth. But we also have someone who's asking about uh, the impact of climate change on Lake Champlain. So I want to ask each of you to quickly address um, how you're addressing, uh, addressing uh, uh, climate change, particularly sea level rise, and uh, as, as climate change impacts upon uh, uh, Lake Champlain for you, David. And David, could you go ahead well, and show I'll your screen again? Lake Champlain piece. Sorry, um, can you put your contact slide back up? Um, sure. I think you just need to show your screen again. Do you see my screen now? Yep, great, thank you. Yes, we see it. OK. So uh, I'll, I'll speak quickly, because I probably had the least amount to say when it comes to uh, sea level rise and, uh, and the impact on Lake Champlain. Um, from, for us, the biggest issue is stormwater and stormwater management. 
um, we see uh, certainly a, an increase in the amount and the frequency of, uh, of severe storms. And uh, when it rains really hard and our wastewater treatment system gets overwhelmed, it, we dump sewage right into the lake, and that's a major issue. So um, part of our waterfront, uh, downtown waterfront master plan is really looking comprehensively at stormwater management uh, to augment the, the system that we currently have in place. When it comes to sea level rise, um, it's, uh, it's a much more complicated factor to understand how does a rise in uh, the, the sea level influence uh, Lake Champlain that's another 100 feet higher and uh, uh, disconnected through a uh, system of laws. Uh, this is Rick. Um, in Portsmouth, we're just beginning, as a matter of fact, this week we just started our first meeting on a uh, an adaptation and resilience plan to look at the impacts of sea level rise on the city. It's not, not simply the area that I was talking about in the central waterfront. But some of the other areas that are, are more residential or, or institutional, we have a couple of tidal uh, mill ponds um, that are on both the north side and the south side of our downtown, and then some creeks that are uh, coming in from a little bit fur further south of the downtown, uh, where we already have some significant flooding um, issues at, uh, at the very high tides and in northeasters. And, um, so we're starting the process of looking at that and trying to identify uh, where the impacts are both on, on public, um, public facilities and on, on private development. Things, we'll be looking at things like um, seawalls or existing seawalls or any places where we need to be looking at uh, modifying those. Um, uh, sewer infrastructure also, we've been, we've been uh, in the middle of a, uh, we're in the middle of a long-term um, project to separate stormwater and, and um, Sanitary sewers, and uh, we have a we're under an EPA consent decree to, decree to uh, update our wastewater treatment uh, facilities. And as I mentioned, one of those is on Pierce Island, uh, right at the uh, edge of the downtown. So we're we're about to begin that process, and should have a uh, a preliminary study done in a couple months. Uh, this is Bill Needleman, and I think you know we're probably in a similar situation to both uh, Burlington and Portsmouth. We we too are struggling with stormwater issues. Um, we are, in addition to trying to to deal with our combined sewer overflows, like with Burlington, we're also uh, looking at the quality of the stormwater that doesn't go through the sanitary system, and um, are having to address some major. Uh, retention uh, facilities that we're going to be some subsurface retention facilities, and balancing that with you know what happens when those retention facilities uh, may be underwater, and uh, we have worked with the state of Maine and the New England Environmental Finance Center to try to understand uh, at least in, in, a, in a first stage um, how might we approach the policy and infrastructure decisions that higher sea levels will will present us. Um, we took the first step working with those other two entities to um, do some scenario-based evaluations on a uh, portion of our city, our back cove. So we didn't look at the working waterfront and our inner harbor first, because that's probably going to be the most complicated area. So we looked at a portion of the city which is still complicated, um, and then just tried to understand what are the, what are the potential costs of doing nothing versus the cost of some predictable implementation um, uh, and adaptation strategy such as a, a seawall or a berm. Um, as a, not as a, as a recommendation, but as an example of how might you start to weigh the different adap adaptive strategies, you know, and, you know, it's become very clear. We're either going to have to fill more, uh, we're going to have to barricade, or we're going to have to retreat. Um, and there's and there are some areas that we also we want to make sure that we allow uh, estuarian and beach environments to be able to migrate, which may mean have certainly have a, a uh, upland impact. So uh, it's a, it's a thorny question for which we don't have answers, and we're just starting to have the conversation. Okay, Brittany, I believe we are about out of time now. Is that right? Yeah, we are. So um, if, there, if we didn't get to you. Encourage people to contact the mm -hmm. speakers individually for answers. 
Yes. Okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ben and um, Will, uh, Bill and uh, Rick and David for the, pr the presentation today. Um, I'm going to switch it over to my screen now and I'm going to go over just a couple reminders on how the attendees can log their CM credits. Um, so thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So first, um, to log your STEAM credits for, atten for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, July 27th, and then select today's webcast, which is a tale of three waterfronts. And this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And also, we are recording today's session, so you will be able to find that along with a PDF of the presentations at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. So this does conclude today's session. I want to thank everyone again for attending.